you all back to another episode of Think Tech Wise Human Humane Architecture. And we're broadcasting in times of that the whole world is planning, proposing uh, post pandemic productions. And so we here representing the built environment have been thinking about us and um, that indoor spaces aren't that easy anymore, nor are outdoors unless we behave, but you, don't, you never know about other people. So we got excited about uh, indoor open spaces, and they're traditionally called courtyards or atriums, and we're on a total volume eight uh, show series of that one, and this is year number seven. And I'm happy to say uh, we have our dream team together, our triumvirate here, broadcasting from three different locations in the world, me near Würzburg, Germany, uh, my co-host, uh, DeSoto Brown, back in Hawaii. Hi, DeSoto. Good day, everybody. And who we certainly can call by now more than a guest uh, than and our additional co-host. That is, um, uh, that is Edward Killingsworth, a long-term friend and business partner, Ron Lindgren, back in uh, your Long Beach, California. Hi, Ron. Hello. Just to have you back. So let's go to the first slide, and I have to say, if our show is good for anything, it's uh, pretty much um, to reflect on. So if you watch them, uh, mostly we think about what we haven't said and what we forgot, and that's a good thing. So here, last week, uh, our guest was talking to David Rockwood, and he was sharing uh, his visions for Hawaii, as well as for his uh, fellow uh, tropical paradise in Vietnam. And uh, shame on me, sorry for that, I left it up to now, which is probably even better for you, Ron, to share your very obvious um, uh, connection to, to that paradise as well. And that's what we see there in large in you, Ron, back then. So tell us about your time in Vietnam and also your architectural experiences. Yes, that photograph of me is when I was an impossibly young 27-year-old naval ensign in a CB battalion based in Da Nang, Vietnam, where David Rockwood has been doing some, some homes. Uh, of course, my work with the CBs in terms of architecture was pretty much limited to light wood framing, some plywood, some insect screen, and some sandbags. Uh, and the, even though I, I was bragging about having a master's degree from MIT before being drafted into the military, that sort of school experience might not go so far in terms of the little story I have to tell. Uh, our base was, uh, our TV base was uh, at the base of a mountain. On the other side of the mountain, there was a tremendous amount of enemy activity, hundreds and hundreds of people passing through at night. So I was asked to design a fortress up in a, a notch in the mountains with two machine guns looking out on that group uh, of enemy. We were out of sandbag, but of course we had all the sand in the world uh, at the coast of Vietnam. So this genius said, well, why can't we just tie uh, plywood panels together with wires, hold the panels apart, and fill them with sand? That'll make a, a you know a massive protection. Well, thank God when the enemy actually did some charging up the mountain during the Tet Offensive, the four guys that were in there got out of there before a rocket propelled grenade hit it. Those wires were already under such tension that when the uh, RPG explosion occurred, the fortress completely disappeared and was scattered around for hundreds of yards. Thank God nobody was hurt because of my stupid idea about how to replace sandbag with sand. <laughs> well, uh, you know, this is how we learn, and you learned in real-world experience rather than just being taught in MIT, and I think that goes to show how real-world experience makes a very big difference. Um, and the other thing that we can say about the slide that we're looking right at right now, um, one of the, the on the bottom right uh, is a reference to presidents. And presidents, we did a show a long time ago, Martin and I, about presidents who had been here in Hawaii, most of whom had just visited. But we know that President Carter and his wife actually lived here when he was in the Navy in the late 40s and early 1950s. And he is an admirable person for continuing to pursue his work 
in Habitat for Humanity, even as a very elderly man and with various um, physical ailments, he still participates in constructing homes for people who need homes. And that's kind of what the Rockwood uh, structure is trying to do in Vietnam, too, is to use different materials but also make homes for people. So with that presidential connection, um, we're going to be refer referencing some other significant people in uh, our Hawaiian scene. And Martin, do you want to get us to our next yeah. slide? Yeah, but for we do, I have to say, Ron, you and, and Jimmy really, for me, represent the best of America and the reason why I'm happy to have become American as well. You guys aged well and great, and that's true for your architecture and uh, as well for you as, as people. So my, my highest appreciation for that. And yes, DeSoto, we've, we've been, uh, we have another reference that gets us a little bit back to the island. That's the top right. We did a show about Magnum PI and its relationship to island architecture. And so um, Magnum, obviously, um, you, you told me, DeSoto, that they discontinued the original Hawaii 5 o They had kind of repurposed the studio in your foothills of Diamond Head to basically install Magnum PI. Right. And Tom Selleck was, was depicting um, basically that sort of societal challenge of you guys, Ron, having been coming back, but different than in the past where they were just shown as broken people and having a lot of attention deficit disorder problems, which for sure they have. They tried a different angle. That was that was very interesting, and I told you guys, and it made you laugh, but sort of the laugh got stuck in your throat as well, because German TV, when it was first broadcasting that and translating it, they censored it because they thought there was too much for Germans, the whole heavy kind of background, so they kind of shortcutted it. And only when they kind of re-showed it in private TV, they, they showed the whole thing. So that's, that's very interesting. So Tom Selleck in, uh, in Magnum P.I., let's go to the next slide. Um, different than the current reboot, uh, which the solo and you and I were analyzing as sort of a virtual, a fictitious setting that doesn't exist, the house he's right. you know, living in, where she at this point, because she's a woman now. Um, uh, sorry, uh, Magnum is a guy still, but, but Higgins is a woman. But anyway, right. where they live, I think where, 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 where the... Uh, she Higgins lived, you know, is, is a fictional house, a computer rendered house. While well, way back, the house was real. They were shooting it, and that was on the way to Waimanalo at the, at the beginning of Waimanalo. And you see the side here. And um, you've been keeping me up on pace and sharing with me that we've been already PIing and was spreading the rumors that Obama talking president. Um, and by the way, people vote, right? I mean, all the people Absolutely. we've been talking about now. Are, are examples of what to reconnect those. So in less yes. than three weeks, people go and vote. We need to go back to these, reconnect to these glorious times we keep talking about, right? Yes, correct. And Obama, obviously, you know, being less diplomatic for us, but also gets some pretty critical press now, and it's related to the bottom picture. You will update us on that one, Mr. Well, yeah, this is the site of, this was the original house that was used as the site of the Higgins home, and where Thomas Magnum supposedly lived in the original series of Magnum P.I. And it was originally a private home, and they did a great deal of location filming there. And it has now been purchased. The original 1920s or 30s house has been demolished. It's being entirely rebuilt. And unfortunately, it's on the coastline, obviously, as you can see in the aerial photograph. We are having problems with our, our rising sea levels the lack of sand, and particularly the construction of retaining walls that prevent the normal migration of sand and thus can disrupt and destroy beaches. And unfortunately, that's a situation here that um, Barack Obama is being criticized for, for the construction of the new structures on this site, where his one of his houses is going to be, because of this sand disruptive uh, retaining wall that's there. And we also see in the upper yeah. corner, in the upper left corner, um, what had what was the original guest house on this site when it was a private home. That's purportedly where Thomas Magnum, the character, lived. And that is still standing, or still was at the time this picture was taken. And so uh, Martin was pointing out, we wonder what's going to happen to it. And 
wouldn't it be nice if it was used for housing homeless people, of which there are unfortunately a great many in this neighborhood, in this part of the world? Yeah, so dear President, uh, please listen to us. And uh, we refer to the top rise of uh, previous shows where we were sharing how he grew up, brought a modest and with a grandma in a very nice mid-century modern apartment building close to Punahou School. So hopefully he remembers that, how it is to live, you know, humble and, and, and rather simple. And so hopefully he then shares with this, uh, which gets us to the next slide, which uh, with an increasingly critical um, population on the islands, because this is just a couple of feet down the road from where he will reside. These are the suburban nomads, how we like to call them, preferring it over uh, homeless who have this, uh, you know, street linear tent camp there. So we were thinking, what could we do for these people, which gets us to the next slide. And we've been shedding a light on that uh, here and there in the past couple of shows, but we want to dig a little deeper and give you a little bit more comprehensive view of that. The project is called the Cargo Courtyard Cabanas, basically using the shipping containers, lining them up in a row in a very sort of militaristic marching order way to what you, Ron, always kindly call for a humanist and humane mission in uh, spreading them out by the by their width, which is eight feet. So you automatically, very much along the lines of the all-American sales pitch of buying one and got one free, you get it um, basically 320 because the container is 40 by 8, doing the math, 320 indoor space plus that for free outdoor space of uh, the same kind. So let's go to the next slide and look at the project a little closer, and I invite you guys to chip in because I'm obviously familiar because I've been developing it with the emerging generation, but this is a chance to have respected peers uh, judge it and look at it. So you guys please chip in and uh, tell us how you feel about it. Yeah, I'd like to, I'd like to say uh, it shows the courtyard. Yes, Ron. Yeah, I'd like to say that uh, I've had a chance to study these seven or eight or nine slides of this uh, this concept, and it, it just struck me when I looked at it that, yes, this uh, would be wonderful options for the homeless and the dispossessed at one end of the, the, of the social and economic scale, but someone ought to build this on an outer island uh, for uh, those uh, maybe the 1% who love to go glamping, this kind of project would make an, a, an amazing glamping experience, and, and then it could be a model for how that, in turn, could be turned into something for our dispossessed and homeless. Great. We will very much consider that. Let's go to the next slide here. Which is, again, you see me, I've been taking up, hopefully it's just the cold and not the, the other big thing here, but you see me bundled up here in my sweater and shirt and another shirt underneath, so I have a cold, hopefully all me, because of the cold. So in a why I always say, you know, you should have your outdoor shower, so you see that uh, next to me here. The outdoor shower is just a must for me. And then also creating privacy, we're cutting like an opening three-fifths uh, into the container side, and because the courtyard is already secluded by its boundary of the neighboring container and the doors, all you need is a stocking shower, a shower curtain that's water resistance that you can pull close to, you know, keep the rain out a little bit more, but you don't need much more. So we're talking again, very low budget, uh, low key as what we're proposing. We polemically call this the $3,000 home because that's what the cost of a huge shipping container is. And again, you get you buy one, you get one free. And that's the raw cost construction that sounds very attractive. And then you need to obviously add and customize it more. And But again, if you're having a, a rainwater catchment in a tank on, on your roof uh, and, you know, you're, 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 you, can, you can feed your shower with it. That's what we're suggesting. Let's go to the next slide. And yeah, you, you made uh, you made a four distiller here, then the kind of the bird's eye view. I'm going to share the observation. The distiller might have been kicked out here, so I guess it's just wrong. 
you and me. So this is showing the, the bird's eye view here of, of the containers, showing again that the space in between is as important as the space inside, because in Hawaii, you could be outside all the time if you would want to. Want to, and I did it myself in my self experiment in the Waikiki Grand, having the jealousies and the sliding doors open all the time. And you spend some significant time on the island as well, Ron. And I know you're an outdoor fan and you shit with us. You were bicycling from the heart of Waikiki out there to the Kahala when you were renovating it, right? So, us howling, yes. maybe the outdoors and the, the beauty of Hawaii even more as if you would be, if you would be born there, right? When I when I see this uh, aerial shot of the uh, eight uh, uh, steel containers, I, c I can see too where a portion of the top of the containers could be a sun deck, and it could just be an ordinary wooden ladder that creates the access, because the courtyards themselves will be uh, wonderfully cool and shady for most of the day, but around noon one could climb up up at one end of the top of a container and suddenly have uh, a, a, a broader view over the property and catch some catch some rays. Well, that's that's great um, observation recommendation from you. We are referring to your show about your own house because that's what you have been doing. Your garage, you know, you have been utilizing the top of your garage to make it an additional outdoor open to the sky uh, open courtyard. Right. So then, thank you for that recommendation. And that's how it's thought, basically, here. Um, you need to stay cool in the containers. So we're saying here we pass out some roof membranes, and then we encourage the dwellers to build their own green roofs, shove up some dirt there, and, and grow stuff. And they would do what you see in my uh, background picture. You see that green stuff uh, to my right. And it's also the neighboring container that's going to be a green wall that you have to cultivate, and you got to keep it green because it's going to make you – Stay cool. And that's kind of the key. I mean, people are sort of engaged, and it's kind of a participatory uh, process. Let's go to the next slide, which shares with us um, another aspect. We need private indoor space. We need private outdoor space, as we were doing a pitch and a series of shows here. But we also need compelling um, uh, collective and, and public outdoor gathering spaces. And so here... You can see that the, the, the front of um, basically the container, and what you what you will get is kind of an irritation. Um, it's a little bit like Lucan's Eshery House, where what you see is not exactly what you guess or what you would expect it to be. So here, where the container doors are, is actually the courtyard, because the container doors are swing open to enclose the courtyard, and, and what you see there where they're sitting is the uh, opening on the end of the container, and we inserted a wooden lattice and a bench so people can basically sit outside in their architecture. And if we go to the next slide, um, we're having uh, potentially the situation of a little community where you have that street and you got this sequence of solids and voids, and in the void you can basically sit. So this is where grandma can chat, where kids can play, you would have to add some additional shading and trees, just like you guys have been demonstrating so well on the uh, on, on the Long Beach University campus, uh, campus right, where, where foliage is, is a real key, so you would have to add that as well. But overall, a very kind of a playful and pleasant situation. And go to the next slide. Um, us talking politicians, we really would have hoped that uh, Dwayne The Rock Johnson would have, you know, keeping his nomination up for president and uh, but be featuring him as encouragement to do next time. And then there is another guy up there whose uh, real name is Patrick Hernandez, but we know him more as Bruno Mars, and he actually grew up uh, in um, out on the streets with his father, uh, just like Dwayne The Rock was with a single mom, and they were living on few dollars. So they know um, what it means to try to make it on the island with little. And so I think your uh, suggestion to maybe, you know, knock on their doors and saying, you know, let's do something along the lines that you were saying. And once it's established, maybe they could become advocates and mentors for a program to uh, have these, you know, move out onto the islands and create little communities. And 
So let's go to the next slide. Um, Ron, you have been on, on campus briefly around the National Bacomomo Symposium, and you basically walked from the architecture school to uh, East West Center by IMP, which I know you appreciated a lot. And I wish, you know, I could have presented you my school the way we see it here, because that's how it would have been if Francis Oda, Francis Architect at that time, wouldn't have made John Hara do, uh, do what we currently find. And that would have been this one here, pushing actually the building out of the central axis of the quad, so the quad was open to the street, given an address. And uh, the building itself being comprised of a multitude of courtyard, single-loaded corridor, um, orientation fine uh, facing south at the bottom of the rendering. And doesn't that sound very much like it reminds me of what you guys have been doing on your campus in Long Beach, Ron? Yes. Uh, my boss had the opportunity of being the master planner at a campus that's now 35,000 students. And because he was there for over... 40 some years, which was a record in uh, educational history, he was able to, to design and build buildings or direct other architects to design and build buildings through a master plan uh, that involved, uh, to a great extent, courtyards. But those courtyards had to be beautifully landscaped spaces that provided access uh, from place to place in this very large campus. Thanks much, Ron. So let's move on to the next slide here, and which is uh, getting to the end of the show, but we're now uh, basically sharing our experiences with Courtyard. Uh, in the next show, it's going to be uh, you, DeSoto, and your work environment, and this one here is me. And do you recall the project, DeSoto? Okay, so this is this is the preschool that you did in Germany, and as I remember, this was one of the first projects you worked on. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. Okay. And the thing that struck me here was, and you just explained this before the show, that when this was built, the client originally wanted there to be a big fence or a wall around the property, and you didn't want to agree to that, and you didn't like that. And what you instead did was to set the school facade back from the street. You said it was a distance of about 15 feet. And then that allowed you to build this open entry courtyard that we see in the big picture but it's got this very interesting gate, which really struck me. The gate is mounted on a central vertical um, support, and then it can pivot. Either it can be completely closed, or it can pivot to be at a right angle. And when it's at a right angle, it opens. So that courtyard becomes open. So during the school day, as you said, first person in in the morning opens the gate, and then the school can welcome its children and or adults if they come in as well. But then at night, or when the school is closed, it can be completely shut off with that gate, but it still is a, it, it's a nice clean facade with the brick, uh, mostly um, opaque facade, but it's got this open space that is, is not a big fence, and it's not, it's not off-putting, and as you said, if you install a fence or a big wall, people want to get over that because it's a visual barrier. If it isn't there, then people don't feel that they want to break in and get into something that they can't see. So that was your solution to opening up a courtyard and making this an entry court for the preschool. Absolutely. And with that way, also an homage, Ron, to your guys' case study house uh, thinking and philosophy of keeping the houses rather bluntly, um, you know, opaque uh, towards the street and then opening them up fully towards, um, you know, the, the the main yard in the back, which is the case with this with this project here as well. And yeah, as you said, the so this is a different kind of courtyard. It's kind of a more processional courtyard. It's not the destination, but it's like on the way to the building. Right. Um, you you basically slowly but surely basically uh, you know get people in in and out. And that uh, gets us to the next slide, which is our final slide here, uh, which gets us back to a project we've been mentioning here and there as well. It's the tropical textile is the, the, the working title for the project. It's for, once again, for UH. 
as an alternative to the uh, Cargo Courtyard Cabanas to run freight, suggestion would also be, which we've been developing it for, in Waimanalo at the C-Car location up the hill to be prototyped. And then once they've proven to work, they could venture out down hill and, and provide the uh, housing for the uh, suburban nomads. This one here was another um, uh, investigation in providing a sort of a demonstration building for CTAR itself on the backside of the Manoa marketplace here. And it's, com it's basically a, a developed together with Great Pacific Rocky Mountain Precast with like less campers, a three dimensional structural grid, three by three by three feet that makes sure that there's never any sun ever hitting the inside. So the horizontal parts are, phase, are shading to the south, the vertical ones to the west and the east. And it also has a central courtyard in the middle that we see at the very top left. And what we see next to it in the middle top is that the whole uh, structure is basically running over not just the vertical fenestrations, but also the horizontal one, and it's giving also a, sh a shading canopy, just like trees do, to everything above. An interesting feature is uh, reconnecting back to uh, my the art student, uh, Dustin Chang, is investigating inv evaporative cooling, which only works in our mild and not so humid tropics. And uh, water is, as we said, a traditional feature of all the ancient courtyards of the Greek and the Roman and the Chinese. Here, the rainwater of the roof would be channeled through the courtyard uh, and the staircase being part of. And that way, basically, run the storm runoff water through gabions, which are these metal cages that you fill with lava rock, and then you filter the the water through, and it comes out purified. Right. And we were making, you know, a funny comment <laughs> towards the absurdity of things. You want to share that one, Desoto? Yeah, you were talking about importing water from France, which has been filtered through their volcanic stone in their volcanic region. And the absurd thing is, of course, that all of the water that we drink from the tap in the Hawaiian Islands has already been filtered through volcanic stone, even more wonderfully than in France. So why the heck are we bothering to bring it all the way in from Europe when we've got it just here is even better? <laughs> Absolutely. So perfect closing note. And that, that, that water we don't want to buy anymore is called Volvic. So we have our own volcanic exactly. water to make on our island. Right. Great. So we're, we're at the end of the show, uh, guys. Uh, looking forward to our conclusion next week where if you guys sharing your uh, wrapping up uh, thoughts about that very timely, um, you know, architectural typology of courtyards, and you just sort of taking us to your work, and you, Ron, looking back and recapping again uh, the project you and your business partner, Larry, together with your friend and boss, Ed, have been doing as far as more urban and more sort of high-rise courtyards and atriums. And we look much forward to that one. Can't wait. And until then, uh, as always, stay safe and sound. And see you next week. Bye.